Growing up, he didn't have a pot to piss in, but he did have a popcorn tin. Adam Carolla. Yeah, get it on. Got to get it on. The church has got a mandate to get it on. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for telling a friend. We love that about you, right, Gina Grant? That's right. And Paul Brian. Call now because I want your packer in my mouth. Well, Mark Thomas, who I grew up Thompson. listening to, uh, Thompson. Oh, <laughs> well, it was Mark and Brian. They didn't yeah. go Mark Thompson and Brian. Brian. It was his nose. What's his nose? Yes. Uh, Mark and Brian. Mark and Brian. KLOS. Always listen to uh, those guys on the construction side, driving the truck. You know, morning radio for the schedule I was on was kind of insane because most people do not get to listen to all of morning radio right. because morning radio is 6 a.m. to 10 a.m. Drive time. And most people are in their car for 30 minutes yeah. and they catch the 7.30 mm -hmm. to 8 slot or whatever it is. But uh, I work construction the entire time those guys were on and I was up at 6.15 and I'd set the radio and I'd listen and then I'd get my truck and I'd put it on the radio mm -hmm. and I'd listen to Mark and Brian. And then I would get to either the job site or the cabinet shop in Chatsworth and I would just walk in and turn it up on the <laughs> radio there and I would just listen straight on through. And I just remember thinking, God, it sounds like they're having a ball on yeah. the show and it was these students love each other <laughs> <laughs> the uh you know it was oh we got strippers and we're throwing a christmas party and billy bob thornton has stopped by to sing mm -hmm. a song and i was just like oh anywhere but this industrial park in deep <laughs> chatsworth where i'm dying over here and, and man if i could get into that studio oh. and boy I, I bet i could contribute i even made a tape for them for back. mark and brian for Mark and Brian. Wow. Tell them we have it. We got to dig that up. It's... Geo is the only copy. <laughs> Probably. It's, it's somewhere. Mark's good at keeping shit, so... Remind me to talk to uh, Mark about it. I'm going to make a thing. They did a homemade comedy contest every year. And I don't know if they did it from year one, but they, they did a, like a homemade comedy contest. Mm -hmm. And people would make their funny tapes... And they would submit them. And um, they'd get thousands of tapes, I'm sure. And they would play like the finalist and then they would vote on it and they would announce the funniest comedy tape mm. that was submitted. And it was everything from kind of Weird Al songs to... I was going to say, it was the open competition. There were songs, there were impressions, there were sketches. There was all the above, but there was no categories. It mm, was just maybe. whatever makes us laugh. Right. Sometimes it'd be really ridiculous, kind of non sequitur stuff. Sometimes it would be skits, sometimes songs. And I put together this comedy, morning comedy tape where I was doing my... Um, oh... I think what it was, I think the premise for my comedy tape, and they just, the only rule was, I don't know, it can't be more than two minutes sure. or three minutes or whatever it was. I put together this tape of morning radio, but it wasn't a morning radio like we were, like they did. It was Christian morning radio. Nice. So it was the same stuff they did, but it had a religious angle That's to funny. it. And the, the commercials for the drag, dragster mm. shows and stuff were all that, but it was all religious drag racers. And that's, that's my my vague memory of it. And Geo find it or Chris, it's somewhere on some computer somewhere because we, we did, we have dug it up before, before your time, Chris. Wow. But, you with no knowledge of religion, how did this become uh, on your radar? <laughs> Um, like this is something. This is something someone who went to Catholic school, right. you know what I mean, would do. Did you bring up the Eucharist? I remember uh, Bob was probably still in the league back then. It's a Eucharist joke. Oh, that's funny. Oh, Eucharist. Yeah. Eucharist. yeah. I, um, I I remember thinking, well, what is your angle for sending in this comedy tape? It was the same process I went through with Mr. Bertram and K Rock. Like, why is he calling? Like, what is this? Right. And and. Um, it was called Homemade Humor. And huh. what years did they run that? I mean, it must have been all through the 80s, yeah. the later 80s, early 90s. He'll tell you. And 
It was to the point, I, I had a friend, he was kind of half a musician, he had a little rented house with a few roommates in the San Fernando Valley, but he had like a little recording studio, and I could go over there and record the thing, and it could kind of clumsily edit mm-hmm. the tape, and I, it got to, they had a cutoff date, you know, would be, you know, December 23rd, you know, at the end of the year, and, and of course... It was, you know, midnight, and I was running it over to KLOS, which is on the far ass end of town from where I lived. And I was like giving it to the security guard, Please. you know, like a cassette, like, this is the end, this is the last, like when people pay their taxes sure. and they, you know, they do it at midnight, you know. And, mm-hmm. and I, I was stamped. handing it line. to the guy. I have no idea where, if they ever listened to it. I don't know if it got from the guard shack into yeah, it's Mark at the receptionist and Brian. Desk. Yes, I, or the, the guard liked it too much. Yeah. <laughs> I could, re- I could, I could remember like listening. What they would do is they would go and they would start playing them, mm-hmm. you know, and they'd go, "Oh, this next one's a really funny one." That uh, it, it's funny because, in a way. They're making fun of us. And I'd be like, oh, oh go, go, go. That, that could be it. That could be mine. That could be mine. And then they'd play some stupid thing where, yeah. you know, grandma got run over by a reindeer version Clark and or Ryan. something. Mm-hmm. Right. And I was like, oh, but they would keep going. Oh, and they'd go, oh, I heard this now. Well, after the commercial, we'll play the next one. But uh, it's funny. I've been in radio. This makes fun of radio. I think it's really funny. And I'd be like, oh, please let it be me. I'd be <laughs> driving my truck, you know, please, yep. <laughs> please. And it was always something else. I, I never heard my... My it's tape, colossal disappointment. My tape played, but it it was homemade humor. I thought somehow I could get them this tape the, that they would love it. They would say my name over the air, and oh, and I you'd could be catapulted to stardom. And we got to ask Mark. Like I don't know what they did with the winner. I don't know if they got to come into studio. I don't know if there's cash prizes. No idea. There was something. They there were such a sensation in, in Los Angeles that they had a custom Cadillac <laughs> made and they would like broadcast and drive down Rodeo Drive and pick up Elvis along the way. Like uh, my my mind was racing because yeah. I was like 23, 24. What years were Mark and Brian on in Los Angeles? We'll f- figure it out, Chris. So but well, in 87 to 2012. Oh, 87. Yeah. That's yeah. What it says here. And yeah, so I was I was 23, 24. You were prime for that. Oh, and I was just driving my truck listening the whole time. So well, this was the first, well, before there were you know, muscle shoals and all that. This is the first iteration of Mark. And as I'm sure a lot of people know or maybe don't know, I on my time on the sound on the classic rock station, I did the morning show with him, and that's where I got to know him. And he's fucking great. No matter what he tells you, he's fucking great. Yeah, well, that's what, the name of him, the Rams. No one remembers that. That's Joe Namath on the Rams, what Gina's talking about. No one remembers that era, How dare you? How dare you? Yeah, Namath ended his career with the Rams. Do you I remember? Yeah. Hope it didn't fuck that up. No, he did. I think he ended his career with the Rams. Yeah, uh, people don't really realize now is that everybody is sectioned off into small little bite-sized bits, and they're watching this on Hulu and that yeah. on Peacock, and they're listening to Sirius XM on channel 149 the surge uh, or whatever (laughs) everything's all broken off back then ubiquitous if you pulled up next to a car at a stoplight and they rolled their window down at eight in the morning there's a very good chance they were listening to mark and brian right and and then then you could like show up at work and go hey man did you just hear that bit oh yeah the elvis bit yeah that was funny like people knew it they would get huge celebrities. Yep. They, they, I mean, a listers. They do their Christmas party every year, filled with live performances from a list celebrities, and it just sounded like they were having a ball. They were, and they were like the toast of the town. Yeah. Like you can't really be the toast of a town anymore. I mean, you can radio. you can be a yeah. big celebrity, but you know, like the yeah. toast of the town, yeah. and they were getting TV shows. Adventures offered. of Mark and Brian. Really? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Do you remember when they called everyone stupid replaceable listeners? That was like a badge of honor. Yeah, that was huh. Mark's thing, and it, it carried over to our era. Every they called themselves SRLs. You're all. Know. It was just his whole vibe. And correct me if I'm wrong, Adam, because I know you listen to him every day. Was demeaning the listeners, and they loved it. Yes, and I had just enough low self esteem to buy <laughs> right, right in. into it. 
I would take the rear view of my truck and I'd tilt it down to myself and I'd look at my own reflection yeah. and go, you piece of shit. That's right. That's me. He's talking to you. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> we'll, get into, uh, we'll get into all that. Yes. Sorry. The question I have, well, first of all, I should have gone with Jordan and the Wizards. Secondly, <laughs> what I, what, the question I have is, did he, did they, and if so, how did they avoid like uh, going up against like Howard Stern and his? They like, didn't avoid it. Oh, really? There was a there was a, an era for that. They didn't avoid it. Okay. I, I I remember. Do you remember? I remember before my time, probably. So they hit the air in '87. We figured out they monopolized the airways. At some point, Stern showed up, and I would be guessing 90, 91, mm. early. 92. They 92. were number one till 92. And yeah. his whole thing 92, was. 92, right. Uh, early. Stern's whole thing was, I'm going to fucking crush them. I'm the king of LA radio, <laughs> oh, wow. not these jackasses. Yeah, yeah he's whatever, brutal. Whatever town he showed up yeah. to, from a syndicated standpoint, he would then figure out who was number right. one and then go after yeah. the, the wives right. and the kids yep. and uh, wow. scorched earth. I want to hear yep. about this. Pretty scorched cool. Going on for other eleven or twelve years. Earth yeah. policy. Uh, th- they went on for twenty years past that because oh, yeah, Stern yeah, yeah. hit well, in, in ninety two. Yeah. Yep, yeah. Yep, yep. So um, that and speaking of that and syndication and that, we lost a, a friend and an innovator mm. named Norm Pattis. Um, I got his bio sheet. I knew Norm well. Norm was he ever on this podcast? Probably. That's all I got. Okay, well done. <laughs> he was on Take a Knee. He uh-huh. was on Take a that Knee. That makes sense. He was born in 1943, died uh, just a day or so ago at age uh, 79. He was a private guy, so he didn't, you know, make make a lot of his illness, but he, he struggled, I think, had maybe throat cancer for oh, a while. Oh, God. Um, he was a guy that, in a weird way, reminded me of Trump in certain ways. He was like bigger than life. He's a character. You loved him or you hated he had him. Bravado. Yeah. He he would, you know, he would laugh hysterically. He would show up with a nickel plated revolver <laughs> and a <laughs> Yeah, a sher- that, and a sheriff's badge. I saw that revolver. A sheriff's badge <laughs> and a Laker championship yeah. ring. Yeah. And he was on the board of Los Alamos, nuclear, whatever. Yeah. He was a really substantial guy. He invented Westwood One. I think he told me that he called it Westwood One, but it was really just a small office mm. nowhere, but it was in Westwood, and he thought, mm. I'll call this Westwood One. Sounds grand. I went and worked uh, for Westwood One. Love Line was on. He, he sort of invented syndicated radio. He started in 76 and really built that into a giant industry, and Westwood One had big semi trucks with with broadcast booths in them mm. and would go to concerts and stuff. He, there you book with us. Yeah. At a certain yes. Point. He took syndicated radio and he I don't know if he invented it, but he made it into into the what children? it was. Yeah. He was a, Sports, Love the Lakers. Concerts with Love Line obviously yeah. yes. shows. Uh you know, f- he knew magic and he knew <laughs> LeBron and he knew Curry. He knew every Laker, sat courtside at every game. I sat courtside with him at a game or two, flew privately, always flew private. He was just like, uh, I'm worth it. Yeah. I mean, flew flew to France. <laughs> Private. God I'm bless. Fl- yeah. Um, and nev- a nice guy. I've met with him a few times and super easy to talk to. Not like intimidating in that way. He was a big energy guy. Yeah. He always had ideas. He really kind of reminded me of... Um, I'm trying to think of as uh, you mentioned Trump, which is an apt comparison. They they are uh, they they promote the, not promote themselves, but you know what I mean. They're big fans. Of Less of the baggage of, of Trump, but oh, but I a imagine. big personality that would kind of light up a room. Uh, yeah, he were, reminded me a lot, or had a lot of the same qualities, especially when I interviewed both of them as uh, Brian Grazer, the producer. Mm. Like his thing was. I'm not an actor. I'm not a writer. I put people together and I get shit done. Mm. Like I am t- tenacious. I show up. Uh, I'll, I, I make things happen, mm-hmm. you know. And but but without a special skill per se. Just your skill is you put people together. You have high energy. You're super positive. And Curious. You, you invent shit. You yeah. follow through and you make shit work. And uh, 
Norm and I always had a good time together, a lot of laughs on his uh, private jet. We flew out to Indy for the Indianapolis oh, wow. uh, 500 through, through France. We found, I, went, did, I think I flew to Detroit with him once. And did you ever go on the boat? I've been on the boat. Been on the boat. It was lovely. Was boat? The boat was oh, Brian, great. did you not go on the boat? I've been on anything. <laughs> he had a, a speed boat. Uh, mm-hmm. He he'd say we're going to Catalina. Mm-hmm. So we're going Saturday. Like it was just one. That he had the whole boat sort of outfitted like it was a cigarette <laughs> boat. Would go sixty miles an hour. Like if we can get to Catalina in twenty one minutes. You know, wow. I was like the ferry takes four hours. Norms <laughs> not us. Throttle it forward, cranking up the uh, you know the classic rock right. through the wet dry speakers. Got there, brought my daughter, brought her friend. We were like swimming in the bay, like just uh. Uh, the example that we should all get from Norm Pattis' life is um, it can be short, it can be medium, it can be long. Uh, go get some. Mm. Like, just uh, crank it up. Uh, have a motor. His his he was a he was a great businessman, but it was really his motor that mm, yeah. that Brian Grazer type curiosity. And he wasn't. Well, the track record speaks for themselves. Sure. It wasn't. He wasn't impeded with his own negative thoughts. You know what I mean? He was just like, "I want to do this. Let's do it. Why can't we do it? I'm yeah. gonna do it." And that's that's who Norm was. So Norm will be missed. He was a legend in radio, in he's podcasting. Fame, right? yeah. yeah. He's he's just he's just the Mount Rushmore of uh, radio in the in the behind the scenes right. department, but. Uh, He'll be missed, and his energy will be missed, and his bravado will be missed, yeah. and his sort of zeal will be missed. Always laughing, always talking. Oh, and and again, like you'd see some of the, you know, you'd see him wearing a Lakers championship ring, and be like, "Come on, Norm," and he'd be like, "Why not?" Yeah. You know? <laughs> Pay that team a million dollars. Look yeah. at that picture. Yeah, that's Norm uh, me and Adam and Shaq. And, of course, he knew Shaq. <laughs> of course, he was friends with Shaq. He he knew he knew everyone. That's us in uh, New York. I think back in the day. A phrase I'm fond of that applies to Norm perfectly is he didn't get cheated. Mm. You know, out of life, he got he milked everything and then some. Seventy nine years. Lifetimes. Yes, completely. And so you know, yeah, I I don't know that your life. Should not be me- should not be measured numerically per se. I mean, we all go that guy died at seventy nine, that guy died life. at forty three. Yeah. But let's see how much we can pack into yeah. whatever many years uh, God or whomever gives you. Uh, we lost another friend, Kirstie Alley, who was. Um, I didn't know her personally very well. You I, met her. I, I knew of her. I always followed her work. I well, was a big Cheers fan, and I. I liked her vibe, and um, she was on the show and uh, right about two years ago, and she was going to come on, and she was going to do the first hour, like a one-on-one interview, and ended up going two hours and 15 minutes because I just got so into her that 45 minutes in or something, I just said to Chris, this will be the entire show. Yeah. I'm so happy to be talking to this woman. So dynamic, so interesting. Chris pulled a couple of clips that might uh, be a nice tribute to her. So uh, first is a two-minute clip from that interview about uh, generosity. I was, you gave Scientology five million. I was reading that you gave Scientology five million bucks. Is that true? I've probably donated $10 million to Scientology. Over the course of your career? $10 million to other, other things. I'm pretty generous. Um, I've created uh, literacy centers. I've sent kids to college, that even kids that I don't even know. I've decorated houses for people that I don't really know but have fallen on hard times. I I like to be generous. It's one of my best pleasures in life is to do things for other people. So I would I think it's fair to say a third of the money I've ever made has been donated. Wow. And not just to Scientology, to many, many different kind of... Was that... Char- organizations or my favorite way to do it honestly is to find you know to do it firsthand like when there's a disaster as an example uh katrina or Oklahoma city bombing or different things like when there's catastrophes i like to get a bunch of uh what are they called um giant trucks but what are they called what are the big semis semis and I just like to fill them with everything that you could possibly imagine, you know, even after tornadoes or after 
and and then I like to just drive in and give people things or have, you know, open it up, like take whatever you want with people, especially when something's just happened because it's so horrible when a disaster happens to do the littlest things like a pair of glass, you know, reading glasses or cigarettes. You know, I, I, one time I, I was trying to do something with the red cross, but they didn't want me to have cartons of cigarettes. And I go, okay, the town was just blown away. What the fuck do you think if people need cigarettes? They're nervous. Let's yeah. get them what they want and haircuts and ice and different things like that. So I, I really love doing that, that kind of one-on-one thing. Mm. Yeah. She was dynamic and funny. And I, I think got on the wrong side politically of Hollywood at some point. So they excommunicate you if you, if you disagree with them. And I think she was kind of dealing with that, but never let it bother her. Just kind of kept on keeping on. Uh, we have another clip about uh, gratitude, which I think you'll find uplifting. I was 30 because, yeah, because literally my mom got killed in a car wreck and literally a week later I was hired for my first acting job in Star Trek. So it was a very, you know, I am a forever indebted to Paramount and to Nicholas Meyer, the director, because I had never done anything. And uh, I think I was supposed to come back in on a Monday morning to do my final reading. And on Friday night, my mother and father were killed. We're both in a car accident. My mom died. My dad was severely injured. And uh, so I flew to Wichita immediately and they said, well, we need to see you Monday. And I told my agent to tell them that I, my mother has just been killed and I can't come there now. And my agent, being an agent, said, well, if I tell them that and you never worked, you're not going to get this job. I said, well, I understand that, but my mother just died and my dad is in the hospital. So anyway, they waited for me and they, it almost makes me cry right now when I think about it, you know, they waited for me and they I flew back to LA, I think it was about a week later. And I went in the room and I read for them again. And Nick Meyer said, you've got the job right on the spot. And I just collapsed because I, all these things had happened, you know, my dad was in intensive care and it, it was just so horrible. And then on top of it, then the best thing, the best, one of the best things in my life happened where it started my career and I, I got to experience this business of, it's why I say I love show business. I mean, Paramount Studios and all these people waited for me a week and I'd never done anything in my life and they championed me. I am forever grateful to people that do things like that. That's, it's just an unreal fairy tale story. Yeah. Does it feel sort of surreal like the older I get, the more I look back at these chapters in my life. It almost feels like it was a movie I was watching or something. Like I, I'm not even sure if I even felt like I was completely there the whole time, or if, yeah, if somebody, if we're not, if somebody, if somebody got me really high right now and said, "You never did Love Line. You never did the Man Show. That was just something that's been cooking in your head." I, I'd go, "Really? It seems so <laughs> real." Like. I look back and we think about like just TV in the nineties, you know, and living in LA and that sort of vibe, it just all seems so different. Right. I mean, it was, it was utterly different than it is now. I feel like it was, you know, the thing that I crave and I yearn for is it felt like a lightness of being. It felt like a, it felt like a playful life. I feel like so blessed and lucky that I lived so many you know i've been acting for 40 years and i i just feel so lucky that i've spent all that time yeah had a weird cut um we get it the whole interview's up on our youtube page and you know as i watched that um first off she was uniquely beautiful she was a beautiful strikingly beautiful woman but but very talented and very real and very honest, tell you all about her drug use mm-hmm. and all her feelings. Um, but, it, you know, it's an interesting era because, 
you know, there's two hours of me having a discussion with her about everything. And in the past, when a celebrity would die, you would have their movies or TV mm-hmm. shows to look at, but there were you know who was it wasn't their thoughts and their I don't feelings. really know who Carol O'Connor really was <laughs> he was Archie, Archie Bunker, Bunker but that wasn't him right. he was a progressive guy who was what not about, that character what do you know about Cary Grant yeah. right and then he went on and did Heat, Heat of the, of the Night, Night where he played like a small town sheriff yep. from the south but I don't think he's that guy either I don't really know yeah. who he was and today Everyone has a nice, long-form, sit-down, ask-any-question, high-def interview. And so you will know who they were historically. Yeah, and she was fun in a lot of ways. Do you remember? I think it only ran a season or two. Do you remember her show, Fat Actress? Yes. Talk about someone who just gets it. You know what I mean? Can poke fun at herself. That was a really good show. She had a very good sense of humor about herself. So she shall be missed yes tangentially someone tweeted me to remind me of the great snl sketch the bellissima sketch right. she goes to the italian restaurant she's accosted by sandler and rob schneider, schneider on and on, dana carvey on and on and on it's a great sketch hadn't seen it in years watched it last night i'm like this is an all-time hall of fame yes. snl sketch and they start licking her and she yes she's being, she's being licked <laughs> Groped head and boobs, you know what I mean? But it's an authentic Italian restaurant. And it's not just, she was amazing, not just because she was the straight man, so to speak, and making air quotes, that's hard enough to do, but when you're being physically accosted like Mm -hmm. that and you're trying to play the straight man, it's almost impossible. And she pulls it off. She was amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, she will be missed, that's for sure. Just because we've covered it now, but she apparently had a very short illness with colon cancer. Yeah. Very oh, yeah. Short. Glad you brought that up. Yeah. People don't know. I, she had a very fast cancer. So uh, she shall be missed. Um, just to update, somebody updated me, shifting gears, that I was complaining that instead of throwing the ball, the tall, fat, white guy stood next to the back of the end zone mm-hmm. and trying to take his balls or head off. Uh, why not the dunk, but uh, dunk on the goalpost? But uh, that was outlawed. Oh, Why? yes. Because yes, yes, Jimmy yes. Graham, the tight end for the Saints, I think, the very long, definitely played some six ball. Six or something. Definitely played some college hoops, dunked it and bent the post. Oh, no, and geez. they tilted the post over, and now they had to that's go. That. So they said no more. No Too more. So that's athlete. more important than taking somebody's head off. Yeah, because it's a delay of game. It's a uh-huh. delay. Uh-huh. Well, it I delays. think a death might be too. You can still do it, but you can't touch the post, which kind of ruins it. Right. Oh, you can do it. You well, can, yeah, they said you could still do it, but you cannot make contact with the post. Yeah, that's just you, you jumping. Yeah. Well, throwing. Yeah. yeah. If you can do it. And, if yeah. you clear the post. <laughs> yeah, well, well then I, I am right. We can get back to that. Just stay away from the post or hit it in the middle because if you hit it in the middle you're not going to bend it to one point. side or yeah. the other that's where the post co- is welded if right. you hit it on one end you're going to pull it down all right uh, let me tell you guys about simply safe home should be where your family feels the safest especially over the holidays this season give them the gift of protection with the number one brand home security system simply safe right now simply safe is offering Adam Carolla Show listeners, 40% off of a new security system. We all use it here. Great technology, great company, been with us for years. Nice to see them growing year year to year and year in and year out. Named the best home security system of 2022 by U.S. News and World Report. Third year in a row. 24-7 professional monitoring. Cost under a buck a day. And less than half the price of a traditional home security system. Simply safe. They have an app. Arm or disarm. Unlock uh, for a guest. Access cameras or adjust system settings anytime, anywhere. It's simply safe. Right, Dawson? Don't miss your chance to save big on our favorite security system. Get 40% off any new system at simplysafe.com slash Adam today. That's simplysafe.com slash Adam. There's no safe like Simply Safe. Very funny stand-up comedian and actor Barry Brewer in studio right after this. Barry Brewer on the Adam Carolla Show. Never had this thought before, Barry Brewer, but if you're going to get whipped by a belt, if it's a reversible belt, Uh it should count as two. (laughs) I agree. single slap. I wish you could tell my mom that. We got a black side and we got a brown suede side, (laughs) and that's two belts. So each slap, my client will now count as... (laughs) 
Each one will count as two. Yes. Yeah, that would have been nice. I would have had a lot less whoopings if that was the case. She did not count them at all. Just whatever she felt that day, or however bad I was. Here's a thought. Uh, I noticed that every, I was never whipped or whooped by my parents. Uh-huh. <laughs> Here we go. You can tell, can't you? But I'm still angry. <laughs> I'm still very angry at them for many different things. Most yeah. people I know whose parents whoop them aren't angry. They go, I deserved it. Yes. Versus me and all the complaints I have about my parents, which I never walk back or internalize. You needed whoopings. I needed it. Yeah, you would have appreciated them more as an adult. <laughs> I think I think that um as a as a African American kid growing up in the inner city of Chicago, um, discipline was needed. You know, you as a kid, you're trying to find your way. As a boy, being raised by a single mom, you know, she had to be more assertive, more aggressive because mm-hmm. my dad wasn't there and so forth. So, um, and I, you know, I was taller than my mom, like at twelve, mm-hmm. um, twelve thirteen. Is that when the whooping stopped? That, no, they didn't stop. She Come stopped. On. She put the belt down and started boxing me. In. <laughs> <laughs> I remember it's a great story. Um, but to answer your question, man, I, I just you know you know that they loves you. You, you. you can appreciate it when you get older because you understood. It wasn't just you know. Sometimes I felt it was a little extra because I looked like my dad, but um, <laughs> I was like I didn't pick him. You yeah. did. Right? That's a good point. Um, you know what I mean? No, that's a but, good point. But sometimes you, as you get older, you just see the in hindsight. You see you understood what she was trying to show you, like discipline and understanding what the real world is, and preparing you for that. Taking school seriously, understanding that that's um, one of the vehicles to help you have a better life than she had. So. So that's why I'm not mad at her, because I get it as an adult and a parent now. I understand, because I'm doing the same thing to my children. <laughs> Did you literally throw down with your mom at a certain I, point? So, so I grabbed the belt. At 13 years old, I remember the day my mom took the belt, and it was like a reflex. She was talking, talking, talking. The belt kind of came out nowhere with the swipe, and I just kind of caught it. Yeah, nice. everybody has that story. You remember? Mm. I literally <laughs> caught it, but it was more of a reflex. It wasn't like I was trying to be like defy her. Defiant, yeah. And so I caught it, and she let the belt go. She's like, "Okay, you ready now?" And she put up her fist. <gasps> nice. <Wow. laughs> and my mom God. used to beat up her brother, her older brother, mm. growing up. I know these stories because her my uncle told me. Mm. So um, I can't believe your dad left all that. <laughs> I can see why. <laughs> <laughs> She's, she runs my stepfather now. He's the he's he. But anyway, she puts up her fist in the stands, and you can tell she could box because this mm. ain't. You could tell the way somebody kind of puts up there. Like, oh, you've done this before. Yeah, you clearly done this before. And I just put my hands. You know, like no sudden movements when mm-hmm. you're like around people that right. have issues. Mm-hmm. I was like, Mom, I don't want to fight. She's like, No, you want to grab the belt? No, you want to fight now? So I don't need the belt no more. It's me and you. I was like, Mom, I don't know. <laughs> She's like, Don't ever. So I was like, Ah. She's about to beat me up. I'm not going to make it to 14. Um, I remember the story like it's yesterday. So, yeah, from then on, I just, I really stopped just being bad. Or and I wasn't a bad kid. I was more of a talkative kid. Naturally, I'm a comedian now, so it makes sense. So that was really all my issue, talking back and just talking. There was a lot of punishment for talking <laughs> in the back in the day, in the classroom, at the dinner table, in front of the adults, mm. to someone else's parents. A lot of, like... Serious penalizing. Now we're supposed to encourage them. Mm, let them finish. Fr- yeah, yeah. Too so much freedom. Yeah. <laughs> now, there was the punishment kids. for talking. Definitely. You were literally just not supposed to talk from zero to 18. You and know? it God help you if it was sassy. Oh my God. Oh boy. They don't got to be sassy. Don't even talk back. Like yeah. if she t- uh, he or t- your parents tell you to do something, you just do it. There's no conversation at all. But it was an impulse that couldn't be controlled if in fact you were funny and you were 13 and you're in class and somebody was making some pre some old teachers make some presentation yeah. it was like saying you're 15 never get a boner and it's like going, <laughs> I, I wish i could control that but i really oh i got one you That's should exactly have brought right. it up. Like <laughs> you said lower and thus. Brian was the same. Oh, yeah. I was the same. You I sat in class. Out, thrown out of class on a regular basis. Yes. Really? Somebody, oh yes. What? For just cracking back to Popping say off. something clever or <laughs> that's dumb that or was whatever. me. That was me. <laughs> I was the clever speaker. Like I would say something clever and it would make the la- class laugh and I would get in trouble too. Yeah, go sit outside yes. or go do whatever. But but you know, I think I think that our industry as comedians and, and entertainers in those settings are not familiar to teachers. I think it's more popular today than it's ever been ever before. But 
I think now teachers are a little more open. Like maybe he'll be a comedian. Maybe yeah. he'll be a right. Maybe that's maybe why he's like be something. Maybe instead of him just being disruptive and obviously has H, you know a, a, what ADHD. Is, yeah, ADHD. like that's something's wrong with him. No, he's <laughs> he might be talented. Who knows? You know, I think we're more open, and then we were not. I remember my teacher came to my comedy show, and she's like. She saw me on stage and she said this after the show, not smiling. She's like, now I get it. Yeah. She oh, literally wow. said that. I was like, what do you mean? She's like, I understand you now. Like, I get you. Like, I know, but damage done. It's <laughs> right. like the Nazi, <laughs> late. the yeah. catch a Nazi the prison trials. guard when he's in his 70s. It was you very regrettable <laughs> what I did. It's like, thank you. Tell that to all the corpses. Right. right. Thank you. You failed me and I had to go to summer school to graduate, but thanks. <laughs> right. I made it anyway. <laughs> I could remember not being able to control my impulse when the teacher said something that sounded like a joke set up in my head. It would just come flying out. When you get older, you kind of can control True. that impulse yeah. and you can sit there and go, look, let's get through this. Or it's not the appropriate moment or this is not going to work, you know, yeah. or we're in church right. or whatever. But you're a kid. You don't control anything. Then You're still trying to find that discipline to life in every way, right? Like 100%. in everything you and do. And they never write on the report card funny. No. <laughs> they write disruptive. 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 Yep. You know? Yep. Disruptive. Disrespectful, talkative, hyper, and I got hyper, hyper. All the time. and there's no way yeah. for them to be able to tell. Like, well, if he's making these kind of jokes, he's obviously smart. But no, you're putting like the dumb <laughs> glass, and you're making smart jokes. We need we need somebody who understands a gift that like you need. We need you in there, Adam, in the class. Yes, right. I would and as you're disruptive and the clever jokes, you're like, no, that's talent. He's yeah. fine. Keep I would him have going. put him in AP <laughs> to a contract. <laughs> It's like, yeah, he's coming with me. Yeah. I got him. He's fine. He'll be fine. He, yeah, he's cl- <laughs> no, That I, was funny. Right? If I was teaching, I would do a lot of, did you just think of that? You're right. That's that quick. Come out the top, right? Oh, no, now write that down. <laughs> My son is like that, 12 years old. He's mm-hmm. like that. He told me something he said in class. I can't say it because it's kind of, um, I would say, sex. That's not sexist. It's kind of sexist, but it was funny. It's the teacher is like a real feminist, strong, and I'm all about everybody being equal, but... He doesn't does, mean it's not funny. It was hilarious. He doesn't understand it. And it was the funniest thing I've heard. And I couldn't laugh in his face because I didn't want to encourage, encourage it. Yeah. But afterwards, I told my wife, I was like, hey, he said that she died laughing. I was like, right? Like, it's funny. Like He's got it. I was like, he got something, but I can't encourage it right now. <laughs> so how did you, were you able, so what happens is, is you get kind of stifled because you have an audience, the audience is the class. Right. You then make your jokes in front of your audience, but then you get kind of knocked down for it. Go stand outside, go to the principal's office, disruptive, all the other things we discussed. So then you have to figure out, once you leave that environment, how do you continue down the comedy path when you've been thwarted, essentially, when you've been told not to do it? That, that it is a liability, true, not a gift. How were you able to do that? I think it's just something, like you were saying earlier, that it just comes out. Like, it's it's something you can't help, right? It's it's who you are. Mm-hmm. And it, no matter how much you try to, to, to stuff it under something and put it away, like, it's what I am and it always showed up and yeah. continued to show up and when I was 19 I remember guys like man you should do some comedy man like it's you're funny I'm like, yeah I should huh yeah and then I did it and got a standing ovation and was in the right setting <laughs> okay <Did you laughs> at ever, the right time and did you venture into the corporate world or did you go straight into comedy what was your I went I my first comedy set was in a church first at a church concert. That was my first <laughs> oh, wow. performance. What is the deal with Jesus? Right? Uh-huh. Jesus, he gave me the gift. So <laughs> um, I got, a, I got. it was, you know, ironic. You know, it was a younger setting. I was a musician growing up. So, church, you know, young church, like young people were more acceptable, mm-hmm. new, like things like that in church. So it wasn't very mm-hmm. standard, old school style of church. So, you know, there was a little more, um, it was a younger pastor, youth pastor. So it was a little more accepted. And so um, got a standing ovation um, nice. and just felt like that moment was important and meant for me to have so that I knew, you know, I was at that stage where I was trying to find out, 19, trying to find out what I'm going to do in life. I got to make a living. I got to, I'm on my own now at this point and I got to find a career. Yeah. And, I think, I think a lot of it also is <clears throat> when you're, when you're in school and everyone's telling you to sit down and shut up, you're kind of on an island. And a lot of it must be 
<clears throat> then you get into a comedy club or the Groundlings or something, and you go, oh, I have I'm brethren here. My other humans. <laughs> yeah, it must be like like moving from Arkansas to Manhattan in the early 70s when you're gay. <laughs> like this secret I'm shame, old, this, thing, this thing I could never talk about, yeah. or I was I was being chastised mm-hmm. or bullied for. Now that, all of a sudden I'm at a club and there's a thousand know. ones of me. Wait, that metaphor is hilarious, right? Because it's true. Like, I'm home. Yeah, like, oh, yeah, my people. Like yeah. I made it. So it was like every funny guy who was getting yelled at in every junior high spread out all over the world then ends up at a club in Chicago or L.A. And you think you're on your own and you think it's a liability. You, you yeah. go like, oh, this all, this gets me into trouble. It does me no good. It doesn't no good. help me, right. It doesn't help me. And then all of a sudden you turn it into a profession. So did you just keep going after the church performance? I did because I was a fan. I used to watch. I remember this as a 13-year-old boy not knowing um, I was aspiring. I wanted. I looked at Martin. Mm-hmm. I looked at the Martin show, Jamie Foxx show. I watched some stand-ups like Sinbad. I remember watching a Sinbad stand-up, praying for him going through his situation mm-hmm. right now. Yeah, I was watching like the old Richard Pryor's um, George Carl, like, like all of these standups, I used to just like it. I used to just like it. And I never knew that I, it was a thing or a career or something to aspire to. So I never connected it with my goofiness or getting in trouble in school. And I just think as I got older, once I found it was a thing, once I saw I had the gift to do it, and I was like, oh, this is that. Mm-hmm. So once I saw that, oh, this gets me to the movies and the television and the things and the people I loved. I have that thing that I used to see all the time as a kid. From then, I just chased that. Yeah. I chased the thing I found when I was 13 that I always admired, not knowing I had it inside of me. And when I saw I had it inside of me, I was like, oh, I got it. It's like, that's the train that goes to to, to, to my destination. I got to take it now. I yeah. can get on that train. So that's what that, if that makes sense. No, it does. And it's interesting that sports is kind of ubiquitous. Every 13 year old boy watches sports and goes, Oh man, I'd love to be out there like one day. Or, right. you know, it's, it's kind of a universal dream for was mine, young, yep. young boys. Everyone at some age, some people give it up when they're 10, you know, but <laughs> other people c- c- keep it going for a while, Thanks. but it's, it's universal. But, and, and, Playing music is a little universal too. Like, you go, oh, rocking out on stage, wouldn't that be be awesome? But comedy is kind of selective, right? Because like every kid watching an NBA game or an NFL game at age ten dreams of being on the field, yeah. but n- not when you watch a stand up. That's one out of twenty five kids who goes, that's that's what I'm gonna be and, doing. But you don't know that. No, as a kid, you're not knowing that. And it's not even a conversation with anybody, right? Some kids maybe be that vocal. I wasn't that vocal because it wasn't a lot of other kids aspiring. Or like the, like if they liked a comedy show or something, they liked it, but not to say, oh, I want to be it necessarily mm-hmm. because I don't I didn't know it was a profession. I didn't understand it. I didn't know they were working. I didn't know like I weren't able to like wrap that around yeah. my mind that this is a thing you could do. I think sports is a little more Seems a little more obtainable. A to B. It seems a little more obtainable yeah. at this age than than even a comic. And your mom in between working the body and doubling up on the jab. <laughs> <laughs> did she Thanks, have mom. did she have any thoughts about that? Not when I was younger. When I was older, I remember when I first started doing comedy, I taped it and I showed her. And I remember her looking at it. And she's like, oh, okay. You should keep working. <laughs> you know what there should she's be? like, you should put more emphasis yeah, yeah. on what you're saying. Like, she's giving me, like, tips. Like, not, mm-hmm. like, Notes. But not really saying I'm good. Just more like, yeah, you need to, you just, yeah. Like, it wasn't like you should keep doing it. It's just like she gave me some notes, but it was just like, it's like you, you know, my mom's very honest. And so it's like the kid that can't draw and they come with a scribble score. Like, my mom would not let me. Please, like five years old, I I painted something like with my crayons, and she's like, "No, this is bad. You have to stay within the lines." Like she would never. She's like, "This is not going on my refrigerator. I'm not oh, looking at this. Showcasing it looks this. terrible." And then my mom showed me, and she she breaks crayons. She's so good at coloring. Like it'd be really dark, whatever color. And she colors within the lines, and she did this masterpiece. I was like, "Oh my god!" She's like, "That's what you do. That belongs on the refrigerator." <laughs> 
Did so, she mount her own work on no, her she own didn't. refrigerator? Because there's got to be a law. <laughs> she didn't mount it, but she definitely gave me a standard that this is how you no. make it to the refrigerator. This is refrigerator worthy. You two have the most wide chasm in mothers that I've oh ever God. heard in my life. But yeah. my mom was raised like that. It has a lot to do. I found out with how she was raised. My mom's mom died when she was 13. Her great aunt raised her, and she raised her very strict. She gave her an allowance and said, you buy all your own hygiene, toiletries, and things like that. If she didn't have a toilet paper, then she couldn't wipe herself. Even though her great aunt, who was raising her, had all these things, she had to be responsible for her own things. So she was grew up very quickly herself. So yeah, ironically, she did that to me. If I got that (laughs) stipend and that rule when I was a kid, I would have taken all the money that was slated for toilet paper and probably spend it at Taco Bell yeah. Yeah. and then I'd be Then you really need the toilet paper. <laughs> I got a Bell B for an Enchirito and, and no I got TP. N- I got no TP. Exactly. So you learn how to be she learned how to be responsible very early and I think that's what she was given to me. You know, naturally because that's what was taught to her. So, and I'm grateful for it because of me moving to LA early on in my life when people couldn't sustain themselves, I could. I'm also wondering this thing just popped into my head. You guys tell me what you think of this idea. Um, You know, we have, we're now living in a day and age where, you know, there's tutors for math and music. You've always been music teachers, but like, like personal stuff. Caesar Milan to come over and whisper to your dog and (laughs) stuff like that. Shouldn't we have some smart person show up at the house and assess your kids? Like, go, I think this is what they're good at. I don't, I don't, I don't. I do they seem to be funny. What happens when they give the answer they don't want to hear? That would yeah, yeah, well, no hilarious. tips. That's the answer. Your for a trash collecting uh, <laughs> career. I don't think you ever really know. Like, I, I think everybody betted on me not to be who I am. You don't think? But if somebody who had a good sense of humor and could assess it in others, like, I have, my son has friends, and some of them are funny. Yeah, and I go. That kid's funny. That right. kid's a sharp kid. Look yeah. out! Look out for him. And then you have the other ones that are kind of flatliners, and you can tell. <laughs> you have pretty to, quick. I don't think you. I don't think you understand the gift that that is that you have mm-hmm. the ability to see it, mm-hmm. right? Like that's a gift too. So who who assigns that person? It's true, mm-hmm. right? You, yeah, Adam, are. right. Like that person to be uh, able to assess and not be biased to whatever to say. Yeah, that's special or not is a gift in itself. And I don't think people have that. I call it the Quincy Jones gift. <laughs> mm, <laughs> right? Yeah. To see past. To fuck blondes. Yeah. To oh, see. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah, well, that's a gift. That's its own gift. But I'm talking about. <laughs> Discover. Yeah, a lot of other see gifts. the talent. To see the talent past what they, maybe what you can see and face yeah, value. Yes. Yeah. There's yeah. a, uh, I'm not looking for African-American street cred here, but I was watching the Shaq <laughs> doc last night. Which is, it's a great doc. It's I just great. Saw my son. It's great. I just I love I it. watched part two last night. Unbelievable. But there's a great Quincy Jones doc out there, too, that I don't know if people saw. But that guy, whew, what Very a tough. body of work, wow. man. And still Insane. Going. And yeah. still going. Yeah. And I just think that GIF, and obviously it exists in many people, I use him because he's somebody I – kind of like noticed it in but you have it adam obviously i do (laughs) you do it's the truth you definitely have it like able to see obviously you have the gift to be funny be talented but you can see it in other people sometimes before they can see it or before they recognize it so i think that's the thing well it's all for two right now (laughs) yeah Yeah. Yeah. he's over two yeah i think y'all doing great what do you mean thank you very much that's hilarious hilarious. i know what you're doing i get it it is it is kind of interesting though when you interview tons and tons of performers and comedians and and i'll leave an interview sometimes and i'll go nah Nothing in the tank. <laughs> yeah. And they'll go, what do you mean the guy just sold out the whatever center? And I'll go, yeah, but there's nothing mm. There's nothing really there. Like, don't of expect substance. 10 years from now, you're not going to no hear yeah. from this person. And they Mambo go, number five. That's right, Lou Bega. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I've had that with a few comedians, even big name comedians sometimes where you go, there's just not that much going on. I'm yeah. listening to them. I'm looking in their eyes. And I don't, I don't know how you measure that. I don't know how you ascertain that. Maybe I'm a truffle sniffing pig. It's a gift. I just sniff out funny and sincerity <laughs> instead of mushrooms. But 
I have had that a lot where I was like, there's not much going on with that person. And comedy can be like music. There can be one hit wonders. Like there, oh, you definitely. can be all the rage, you know, going on in this particular, you know, you can be the it guy, the it girl, but a like, there's like, you can kind of tell when there's not that much there, Lena Dunham. You can't. I'm not mentioning You names. can't. <laughs> That's can. terrible. Adam. You can though. I, I I really think what you're saying is something that is very unique and and not known. I think the average person sees someone's hot. Oh, they're the ish. They got it right, and they're not able to see past that hot moment to say, hmm. They're probably gonna fizz out. And then you sound like a hater when you yeah. say that. Like, yeah. Because I, I was having a conversation about some comedians earlier, and I would never say that openly to make anybody feel way, but. You know, it's a lot of stand-up specials, a lot of people doing a lot of things. And I was just like, but is it special, right? Like, like I want, like I think that is a thing. So I think sometimes you don't know the gift that you have is so unique. Because you like looking at the other person, like, you don't see it? You don't see the lack? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I remember, <laughs> uh, yeah, we were talking about it off the air. We were talking about Lou Bega. Yeah. We were talking about Mamba yeah, sure, number five mm. off the air, though. Mm. I yeah, sure I, believe. I can never tell. I was he, he, he was on Loveline on MTV many years ago, and I kind of the the vibe was strong that he wasn't going to go on to a big recording, uh, hit, you know, big big career. You know, he wasn't going to be Quincy Jones, and so <laughs> I tactfully started saying things like, "Well, you got to strike while the iron's hot." You know what I mean? I mean, you, you got lightning in a bottle now. What's next? And he was like, this shit's going on forever. Like, I remember he looked at me and he was like, I'm confused by what you're saying. And I'm saying, well, I'm saying right now, you this know, you got a lot going on, but a few years from now, maybe not so much. So what's the plan right now? And he's like, why would you're looking this at go it. on you forever? Say that, right? <laughs> yeah. Which uh, I, I would, he, he wish he would have listened. <laughs> I, I don't know if he had a choice, is my point, though. What I don't even know what I was if telling him to do. he opted out. <laughs> yeah, do, do gay porn yeah. now while you can Look, get right. a payday. Look right. for something else. And and it's hard because I think that's the sincerity and the genuine part you're talking about for yourself. Like, being able to be honest with yourself, right? Mm -hmm. Knowing when you really have something and knowing when you don't. Or knowing when it's just a moment. You know, I, I think people live in, they're very disconnected. You know, and I do, I, that's why my mom's showing me like, hey, this is not good. This is good. Right? That yeah. carries on color. to your adult life. And now I'm not, I, I know when my stuff stinks. I'm like, yeah, this is not good. Like, but you I, also do music, right? I do. I'm a musician and a songwriter, yes. And what do you play? I play piano. I play saxophone. I play the drums. Oh, I shit. songwrite. Yeah. <laughs> Did you uh, reunite or ever get in touch with your dad? Was he in your life? My dad was up? here and there. Yeah, I still know. I talk to my dad now. He calls me more now today. But he would come in and out. He mm -hmm. was there like the first five years of my life. Um, all day, every day, apparently. I was very close with him early on in life. And then him and my mom, you know, divorced. And he would just, he was on drugs. And he was, you know, fly by. He will call me, be like, hey, I'm still your dad. I'll talk to you next year. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to tell my kids... <laughs> that i'm gonna say to them what's the earliest you have a memory and they'll go like four yeah. and i'll go okay i was awesome from yeah. zero to yeah. four you don't about. know <laughs> you don't know the nights i stayed up oh. holding you the diapers my dad the tries to do that <laughs> and where's your first memory again son four yeah, yeah. so right about oh. 40 Probably about 47 months in is when I started to taper off. <laughs> taper off. But it's because I had front-loaded so much of the parenting. I'd given all and I, I could everything. give yeah. from zero to, when did you say your first memory was again? Four, four and a half. Oh, that, yeah, like four and uh, yeah. like three months. Right. I, 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 I was tapped out. I prepared you for the world at that point. I gave you all that. That's yeah. right. That's you. right. No, yeah. for sure. Like, And uh, it's funny because it's real. And I talk about it in my stand-up, and that's the real part that's scary sometimes because he calls me like, you know your Aunt Mabel? I don't know her. She held you when you was three. I took you over her house. Right. I was like, okay. <laughs> so, and yeah. I just try to be nice. I was like, oh, no, I don't remember her, but okay. Because I'm not, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not mad. I don't feel any way. I'm grateful for my journey. It wasn't the best or the happiest or everything wasn't peachy cream, but... I understand as I've become an adult, like, hey, this was my journey and it's helped and prepared me for the man I needed to be. So thank you for doing your best. And that's another thing I think we need to learn as children who become adults. Like 
people are doing the best they can or know how or they don't know how and they don't do good. You know yeah. what I mean? And sometimes a, we hold over their head. That's a big question in therapy is yeah. do you believe your parents did the best they could with the tools they had at the time? And I would say yes. Yeah. Yeah. And and does I, your dad have any relationship with your child? He does. He just sent my baby son. I have a two month old. I have two sons. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, one named after me and him because oh, I'm wow. the second. My 12 year old is the third. And then I have another son, Bellamy. And um, my dad has done. I did a joke. I said he sent them a walker and a swing. I was like, wow, you've done more for him. <laughs> He's already ahead of the race. <laughs> I frequently have this conversation, and you guys tell me if it kind of rings true for you. And it it happens a lot. I'm trying to think, I was out to dinner. You go out to dinner with some couple. You start talking about kids. They start talking about their kids. They start talking about. They start suggesting what they need, and you got to get them started in this. And it's important to encourage that. Right. And at some point, about forty-five minutes in, I'll go. You understand? We have talked more about our kids in this one dinner than my parents ever did in my first twenty-two years of life. Like we have. <laughs> This was unheard of in the past. There's no way my parents went out to dinner with some other couple no. and the entire the discussion the was about the potential no. and what we wanted to do. And there's a lot of, well, you got to get them into yeah. coding then. And they got to learn that, you trips know, it's like, like yeah. trips are going to take. So it's important to them to be exposed to them. We didn't even, the whole point of going to dinner was to pretend like the kids were never fucking born so you could have a couple of highballs. <laughs> have and a enjoy moment away from them. Have a exactly. moment for 10 minutes. We're going to have to incessantly hear about them yeah. i don't want to talk about them right and i'm always the one at the table kind of going that eh, i think our kids are going to land on their feet yeah. next subject <laughs> anyway, like, uh, anyway we're, we're arguing over what private school's better but they're all be they're all good yeah. and everyone's fine and here we go yeah i yeah. i don't know how to tactfully get into that but i i, I do notice that parents becomes like a competition to see who's more concerned about their kids i think <laughs> <laughs> I feel like that with my child's mom, my oldest son is my ex, and I feel like she tries to compete with that. But uh, I feel like, like, who's the better parent? I'm like, I'm not in this race. I'm like, I'm just going to do the best oh, I'm that's, that's, See, that's, that's a real thing. My parents had a competition. When Were they, they got together, divorced. though? Yeah. When we who got... are you going to hate more so you want to live with the other person? Right. Yeah. Who that, will do that less? That was a competition, but in the that's wrong a direction. Thing. No, no, that's the same direction. Oh, you're going that? No, I'm not in there. I'm not in the fight. Like, I don't. I don't participate. Like I'm not. Mm. I got too much other stuff to be doing to be trying to. I just want to do. Like I said, my mom with the color. It like do what you can with what you have. Make mm. the best of that. Don't focus on what you can't control. You can't control it, so you don't worry about it. Um, but you're talking about kids. I do think that because of the the trajectory of where we are as as adults, we've like. I think this generation is a lot more conscious of parenting because they're like, man, my mom wouldn't let me talk. Mm. Mm -hmm. And I felt like I could say nothing. And now I'm stuck in this person and I don't like the I'm I messed up as an adult now and I don't want my child to be that way. So I'm going to try to allow. And I feel like we've done too much of it. Right. But I understand it. it's like, yeah, I don't want you to feel that way. I don't feel like nobody can cares about what you have to say. So now you. You know what I mean? Like you turn into this person yeah. that is not very balanced. It's a generation of overcompensating cycle breakers. Yes. And so now they talk about the parent like, oh, I'm trying to do this for my child. And I want this and that. Right. I had to turn like I we work to have a better life for our kids. And I've learned that. But I've seen that it's crippled them so, to some degree. Here, I, I, I have a conversation that I had with my daughter two weeks ago. She's 16. That. I'd like you guys to put on your imaginary war warlock's hat and imagine having this conversation when you were a kid with okay. your parent. Okay. It's like Saturday night, I'm home. She has a friend or two over. I go walking out the back to let uh, Phil out, my dog out in the backyard, do his business, come sort of standing around. And like, I'm startled by a young girl who's over by the kind of outdoor barbecue, sort of looking for something, you know? Mm -hmm. And and I was like, oh, who? Oh. Because uh, there's this movement, like someone in a dark yard, like right. moving on. I said, hey, what are you doing over there? And she said, I'm looking for some trash bags or something. And I said, oh, yeah, okay, go, go on about your way or something. She got the trash bags, she went in the house. Uh, like a half hour later, I, I walk out again. And she startles me again, and and she's in the same like spot. Cat and, and I go, I, know. I go, what are you? It's eleven thirty at night. What are you doing out here, like rooting around? And she's like, I was just looking for something. And I go, oh yeah, oh okay. Well, you scared me, and I think it's time to go in the house or whatever. And she goes in, and then 
about 10 minutes later, my daughter comes out. She goes, what was that all about? I'm like, <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> well, she said that you're kind of hassling her. What? <laughs> I said, uh, and then I got defensive. I was like, oh, I was just I was going outside. I didn't know that didn't mean to harm. You know, and she's like, well, you know, kind of watch it because she's a little, <laughs> Can you imagine? She's a little miff that you're kind of getting in her business that way. And I was like, I wasn't telling her what to do. I just, I was startled by it. I want to know why. She's like, okay, well, just kind of keep an eye on it. Oh and I like, went back in the house and I was like, could you, well, first off, could you imagine r- ratting somebody's dad out? Like, no. hey, your dad talked to me two times about the same thing. I don't, I don't appreciate the tone. That's if you weird. were arrested by said dad, you'd hold on to that for 10 yes. years. Yeah. Yes. I, so it's, a, it's a whole new world. The relationship oh, your kids and their friend, the friends have with the parent. Oof, uh, like, your mom would have got out two belts, one full Bruce Lee, <laughs> gone ten then rounds. thrown them down and put the Tyson mitts up. <laughs> exactly. I, now, it's a whole no. new world. The kids aren't scared. No. The friends aren't scared. They want to come up, settle the your hash. The kid's job is to run interference between the parents and the friends, not the other way around. Like, oh, Dad, we won't do it again. Sorry. Whatever she did, she won't do it again. Hey, Beth, you know, my dad doesn't like that, so don't do that. It's not... Dad, what the fuck? Yeah, like, <laughs> she didn't like my tone. Oh totally my different. God. Speaking of not liking your tone, speaking of which, I have a six-year-old daughter. Wow. And Congrats. her thing now is, like, you know, she's six, so I'll say, uh, Tessa, it's time to brush teeth and uh, put on your shoes and socks. Go, go, go to school. And she's like, all right. She kind of stands up, but she's still looking at the TV yeah, and just kind of watching her show. I'm like, Tessa, shoes, socks, brush teeth. Now, please. And she goes, okay. And next thing I know, she's telling my wife, Daddy yelled my name and he told me yeah. he told me to brush it. I'm like, yeah. And then Christy, my wife, will come out and be like, did you yell at Tessa? Like, United no. Front! Sometimes you, <laughs> need, <laughs> sometimes you need to be stern. Like, you know, the kid will not do the thing. It's I think like, that's a cultural thing, for sure. <laughs> I wish somebody would come to either of us and tell, and tell on. Oh. I would I wouldn't. Okay, I don't know if it's legal. It's to tell cultural. You what Whitey is soft. Why we would you soft. do that? That. Like that is crazy. Listen, these she's I, reporting on my tone at yeah. six years old, yes. and your wife is challenging you. Wait, well, hold on. Did you yell? At least she's her, asking. Like, did you yell at Tess? Like, yes, I, I yelled, yelled at her. Yes, I, I said her name loudly. And you didn't yell it, right? Oh, they're sensitive. Like my son, they they're t- like I cannot. Like my twelve year old, I, he cries at the intensity of. T- I'm like, Beach, what are you doing? Like I'll t- I'm like, what are you doing in school? Why aren't you bringing your books? Right. <laughs> What are you talking to me like that? What do you mean? What are you crying for? Why are you crying? I didn't even did nothing to you. What, what's wrong? What is wrong with you? Boy, if you don't. Ah! And he he's like, always upset. Now he's cowering. Like, he, oh, like one time I walked past him, I was like, I was so, I felt so bad. I walked past him, he's like, Oh my God, flinch. Flinch. I'm like, is somebody beating you? What is wrong with you? Like you act like you are scarred. Like what is going And he's not a small kid. He's like 5'8", 12. He's a basketball player, so he's really like stocky too. What are you flinching? He's. I'm like. (laughs) They're different. So we live in suburbs. I took him out to see my mom. My mom lives in the city of Chicago, and I guess he's heard all the bad things about Chicago. And Chicago is not as bad as the news make it to be. There's no war going on on every inner city block, right? We're at the gas station. I'm walking in the gas station. My wife's in the car. I said, hey, pump the gas, right? He's 12. He's starting to learn response. We got to learn mm-hmm. to pump the gas. You, what pump the gas. Eight, seven, pump a gas. Like, this is what we do, right? I worked at a refinery when I was five. <laughs> right. I, I paid the bills, right? So I'm walking in, and I'm looking back at him, and he's like, Ducking. Oh, oh stand low. This is, a, this is an too African much American Fox. kid, yeah. by the way. I'm so embarrassed. I'm from the inner city, right? <laughs> right. I am black, right? I am from this place. So I'm like, <laughs> it's different when you, this kid, I'm like, he is, I mean, he is nervous if somebody said something. He jumped in the car and I come back. I'm like, why you pump the gas? He's like, somebody said they was coming back around. <laughs> what? What? Coming back around to do what? He's like, I don't know. I don't want to come. I don't want to say either. I don't want to take a chance. <laughs> Like, I was like, I'm gonna leave you here. Don't leave me here. <laughs> I'm like, you're scary. What is wrong with you? You know, These, there's there's a lot of, there's a soft. lot more fear. It's kind of when you're out of first world, you know, when you have first world problems, you sort of do the do the fear <laughs> angle. I was thinking about this the other day when I was watching somebody walking down. It was like footage of someone walking down the street in Manhattan, and somebody hit him in the back of the mm-hmm. head with a baseball bat. This really I, happened. Yes. Yeah. 
And Jesus. this happened to more and more. People are getting punched behind, hit behind the head, you know, all that kind of stuff. I started thinking to myself, you know, when I was a kid, you'd, I'd ride my BMX bike everywhere, skateboards, whatever. There, the no best one, bikes ever. No one wore a helmet ever, <laughs> ever, all the time, anytime. There was no such thing. And now, you know, you talk about like going skiing and first thing something's put on a helmet. Mm-hmm. You oh, put, yeah. that, put that kid in a helmet, you know, you're talking about bi- riding a bike. Oh, yeah, you be, you'll get arrested. That kid riding a mm-hmm. skateboard, riding a scooter, riding a kid's got an electric bike, it's like helmet, 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 helmet. helmet. Now people getting whacked with baseball bats in the street. All I'm saying is, is at a certain point, should we just wear a helmet all the time? Yes. Because she'll I, walk down the street with a helmet. I'm going to yes. walk down Manhattan. Then I'm going to get on one of those rented scooter things. I'm going to zip up there. Then uh, maybe I'll get on a mountain bike. Like At some point, maybe it's a time saver just to put a helmet on. Leave just, it on. So you start picking your outfit with your helmet. Right. right? Like you got an outfit, a helmet for each outfit. It's never go- like Even when you're driving, it's not going to hurt. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Barry uh, Brewer, let me give some uh, plugs out to you. Okay. Uh, Thanks for having Mark, me, man. I really oh, enjoyed pleasure. this. This is dope, man. <laughs> I am Br- Barry Brewer, by the way, dot com for all the live dates, super funny stand up, and the special Chicago I'm Home is available on Amazon Prime. And uh, again, very funny stand up special you. as well. Barry, let me hit Geico and then we'll bring uh, Mark Thompson in. Do you own, do you rent? Well, sure you do one or the other, and then there's your uh, your home, your automotive, or your renter's policy. Why don't you bundle them all up at Geico? Geico makes it easy to bundle your homeowner's or renter's insurance along with your automotive policy. It's a good thing, too, because you already have so much to do around your home. Go to geico.com, get a quote, see just how much you can save when you go to geico.com. All right, legendary Walk of Fame, a Hollywood Walk of Fame recipient. Mark Thompson of Mark and Brian is in studio right after this. Mark Thompson in studio. Mark and Brian, such a big part of my formative comedy years. Mm. Uh, Always great to see you, my friend. Uh, The book, Don't Bump the Record, Kid, My Adventures with Mark and Brian, who um, I cannot understate or oversell how big these guys were in the Los Angeles market and beyond. Uh, from the, uh, as we talked about, 87 to 2012, what we're trying to get to the bottom was was the uh, homemade comedy mm. bits <laughs> that people would send in cassettes. I sent in one. I've told you that before. We'll find it uh, I, one we day. We have to find it. And I don't know how many years you guys did that. You did it a number of years, I yeah. remember. yeah. I yeah. don't know what the vetting process was. <laughs> I don't know if you physically listened to it. I, I will tell you where it began, and it was as many good ideas are. It began uh, very organically. It was, you know, hey, let's see how funny you are. Put something together. Send it in. Uh, Brian took half the box. I took the other half. We took them home, went through it, picked out, you know, cream of the crop, went through that, found the winner. Then as years progressed, it became thousands and thousands. And so then there was committee. And the problem with that, because it would go out to 10 different people, and then later down the road, somebody would say, hey, mine was great, and it didn't even make the first cut. And I would hear it, and it was great. So some pig somewhere didn't think it was fun. So it kind of started to just fall inside of itself. But – What I found unique as I would listen to these things throughout the years, there were basically two categories of good stuff. There were the ones that somebody had a guy who had a production room and they really put some time and it sounded great and usually generally funny. Some of my very favorite ones were bottom basement, no production value, but yet hysterical. And those were the ones that I always sided with because that's what it was supposed to be. You guys would have the big Christmas bash every year. Yeah. I would listen like 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 a guy who was in prison listening to an old timey radio show. <laughs> like, oh, the toast of Broadway and this is they're dressed to the nines and more champagne. And I would just, just be listening. Oh, God, I wish I was there. You guys would do the big blowout. Where would you do that every year? It started um, 
at the beginning in L.A., it started uh, at a hotel out by the airport because I find everything by the airport is five sure. stars. <laughs> yeah, and uh, so we would do it in there in like a, a ballroom, and the, it, but it organically moved to the the heyday was at the Palladium. The Hollywood, the famous Hollywood Palladium. Yeah, the beauty of that room is as soon as you walk in, it smells like urine, which says entertainment. <laughs> and so really the greatest, the cream of the crop shows were in that room. And then it moved to the Will Turn. Then at the end, it was at the uh, Staples, uh, the, the big room at Staples. Um, but the, the heart, the purity was the Palladium. Those shows were Magic and brag a little about some of the acts you would get out there. Um, well, I mean, we had them all. Uh, it, quite honestly, we had uh, Kiss, which was funny. <laughs> Kiss at seven o'clock mm-hmm. in the morning is not an attractive thing <laughs> yeah. uh, to both look at and and hear. Um, Barry Manilow in his heyday with his Christmas album, Bob Hope, uh, Bob Charlton Hope. Heston. Yeah, they came and read to us the night before. I've never witnessed, get this, this is how huge Bob was. He was 91. And we had a. And this is like 1990 or something? Yeah, it's right in there. And we had a traditional thing. We would have a, a celebrity, a, a, a legend. Oh, the come, Yule Log. No, the Yule Log was a different kind of legend. This was the reading of Twas the Night Before Christmas. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and we got Bob Hope to do it. He was 91. He brought his wife. And there is a thing that is turned, and I talked about this in the book. There's a, a thing that's turned Bob Hope jokes. Mm-hmm. Bob Hope jokes are a joke that isn't funny, but when Bob Hope tells it, it's oh, hysterical. Sure. So now Bob being 91, he did the open and the close. His wife did the gist of the middle. Mm-hmm. And Bob opened up with, and I still remember the joke. Here it is, word for word. Um, Twas the night before Christmas when all through the house, not a creature was stirring, not even my agent. It killed. <laughs> right. Okay, it killed. Then his wife did it, and he did the end. Then there was... A, a, a third standing ovation because he got a standing ovation when he came out, a standing ovation for that joke, and then a standing ovation at the end. You know that you're a legend when you can leave the room in the middle of a standing ovation and it's not rude. Wow. That's a good yeah. point. Yeah. And Charlton Heston, and I think you had a story about David Cassidy. David, I mean, we just had a show this past weekend at the Saban, and we commemorated that moment. Uh, we, when we first started, Keith Partridge of the Partridge family sure. for a Correct. lot of people, underrated actor, I believe. Uh, uh, so underrated musician, probably. Uh, you know, he did some good stuff. Yeah, uh, in my opinion, I agree. So, at the beginning of the Mark and Brian program, we couldn't get any any current guests, uh, stars to come in because nobody knew who we were. And so the ones that we could get were stars from shows that had been canceled or over or in the past. They would be glad to have a spotlight shined on them. So we had Danny Bonaducci. I was about to say, had to have the Duch man uh, yeah, there yeah, somewhere. Yeah. And, and look, the thing with Danny, and you know this, anything, anytime, anywhere, tell any story, hysterical, gifted talker. Yes. And the More greatest, I, I want to go down on record. Gina, yeah. can, can you write? Can no, you spell? I can still, yeah. Danny Bonaducci is the greatest storyteller I have ever witnessed in my life. Doesn't matter what the what the topic is, he's got one. So he came in, did the show. While we're doing it... Don't we have a drop of Danny by the Gucci? One. That is the greatest story I have ever heard. <laughs> <laughs> I could hear him saying that while you were saying it. Boy, you're right on it, man. Uh, right. So, so uh, Danny called David... And we put him on the on the air on the phone. Now, David, at this point, had been absent from the scene for 15 years. Mm-hmm. And while we had him, we invited him to come down and do the show. And he said, sure. So he came in. It was my first time to witness. This is early. This is 89. Mm-hmm. My first time to witness 
employees of the radio station come in early to get a glimpse of someone. Mm -hmm. Because David was the biggest pop star we had had, TV star and singing star. But he was back in the room, and we had a, he was ready to accept being a pop idol again, any kind of attention, it seemed, and it felt good to him. He looked good. He sounded good. And we had a great visit, and so I said at the end, listen, the Mark and Brian Christmas show's coming up. We'd love to have you, have you come. And he hesitated, and we kind of said, you know, come on, you'll have a good time. And he finally agreed. We get off the air, and he said, guys, I, I haven't done anything musically in 10 years. I don't even have a band. And we said, look, we got a great house band. Don't worry about it. It's going to be great. So he, he was coming, and I'd never seen a media circus like that. <laughs> Media, because David Cassidy was the biggest star in the world, he disappeared. Now he was back, and we were the ticket for the media to get a shot of it. I had never seen chaos like that. Ticket demand was off the charts, and David came out and did a few things, and then he sang, I Think I Love You. Oh, my God. Mm. And it was, it was massive. It was absolutely one of the biggest single moments. It was up there with Bob Hope doing Twas the Night. Mm -hmm. It was big, and it was great, and he sounded great, and he delivered. You know, you have an anticipated moment like that, bring it home, and he did. It's, you know, I, it's always so tragic with those characters in life. I don't mean that he is a character. I just mean like in the play of life, which is he would play stadiums and, you know, sell out soccer stadiums in Europe, right? To the point where a girl was killed, oh, yeah. crushed, you know, mm -hmm. with the stampede of adoring fans right. and stuff. But he wanted to be Jimi Hendrix. Yeah. yeah. And he knew he was this teeny bopper yeah. and he wanted to rock and roll, but he got cast in the show and he could look out you know, with the 40,000 people that showed up to Shea Stadium and see a bunch of 13-year-old girls, right. you know, and he wanted the respect of the music world and he wanted to be, you know, the Who or Led Zeppelin, but he was a teeny bopper. So they never really fully appreciate that they're selling out stadiums all over yeah. the country yeah, because they're on Tiger Beat, uh, a magazine on the way out in the airport. And there's a part that's very sad about it that they don't... Then fully let, appreciate it. Then let's talk about that because I think that's a, a, a situation. It was the highest paid entertainment in the world for a short time. Oh, wow. Well, David I mean, Cassidy. the thing about it is. Uh, Elvis and the Beatles. Sorry, I'm just Jesus. reading my screen. I mean, that's how big that guy was. Well, the thing with Cassidy, with David, first of all, a great guy. And he credited Mark and Brian with with rejuvenating his career. But I think because what you said is absolutely he wanted to be respected as Jimi Hendrix. But yet he embraced the attention that the, the pop idol side of him brought. And if you're going to really sever the tie, sever it. And don't walk the talk. I mean, get rid of that and don't be that. But he enjoyed the warmth of well, the attention I, that he got. I agree with you, but I also would say that it's not solely his decision. He's got a whole team of people that are telling him we've sold out this show and we've sold out another and you know how much money this is. And he's got a bunch of people around him who don't really care what he does. They want the teeny bopper version so they can cash I, in look, the I, checks. I absolutely 100% agree with that. But the, but the problem is, is that I think that's what caused David's problems. Later yeah, in he life. became a very big drinker. He did. And I think that was really the battle inside of him because he never did get a chance to. No, he did have a chance and it was little noticed. Mm. It just didn't work. And so I think he was struggling with that, I guess, of many do, because how many times do we see a musician who's huge? But they want to be an actor. Mm. Right. And how many times do we see it? Well, every single actor wants to be a singer. Right. It's just this weird thing. And so I don't begin to understand it, but I, I'm perfectly happy to not have a job. <laughs> <laughs> he sold out Madison Square Garden in one day. It was huge. Jesus. Yeah, Wembley St Stadium in 1973. I mean, that was it. He yeah. just went everywhere. But he was really affected by the young girl that was crushed in the stampede and... Um, I don't know where, where that one was. London's White City Stadium. Nearly oh, okay. 800 people injured, and then the 14-year-old oh. girl died days later. 
Did uh, I need a guy like that around yeah. me? I mean, yeah. we got a good guy. Everything that's yeah. huge. Yeah. Could you come over? <laughs> I got you. Yeah, Thank you're always you. your own guy. You need a guy. Yes. You need a Chris. Yes, but it, not in the text that it seems like you're saying it. I understand. Uh, okay. How's Bonaduce's health? I know he was not on good. your show recently. Uh, he was supposed to be. Oh. Yeah, he was invited, and and I had a whole. I mean. I'll tell this story quickly, and then I'll get to your your question. Uh, Danny became a buddy of mine, and so I in, early on, this is early, early Mark and Brian. I invited him to come out to the house and have dinner with us. And so Danny uh, shows up on a moped uh, in Northridge at my house, and I didn't question it because I thought this was the LA thing, and I didn't want to sound like I'm an I- ignorant. And so I, I didn't bring the, I didn't bring it up. And so he came, and I. I don't, I mean, I cooked out and we had dinner, but I don't remember it. What I do remember are the four days that he stayed Mm. at our house in the guest room, slept there. One night I had an appearance and I thought it'd be funny if Danny came because he was still at my house. And I invited him to come to the thing. And Danny said, "Uh, no, thank you. Uh, Linda's going to make popcorn and Matthew and I are going to watch The Wizard of Oz. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and it was odd to come home seriously and find Danny Partridge standing in the kitchen with my wife and son. And I, 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 I just love Danny. And I wrote this story in the book that how long he stayed and, and how much I loved him. And he, I, I, I had made a video for the show and invited Danny. He was coming. It was all set. We had talked. And then he had the first round of which sounds like a stroke. Mm. He had to step away from his radio show. Right. Then he was better, and he went back to work. Then he had to step away again. And his wife called and said, hey, he just can't make it. Uh, so I, I, last I, it's not good right mm. now. It's not good. I don't know exactly what it is, but look, my love for that fella uh, will be forever. I, I I, I, I said it in the book. If you're ever around him, you will be thoroughly entertained because that's how he rolls. True. He's just a party. And, yeah. and I, I hope this gets fixed and I get a chance to hug him and say, hey, because he's one of the best. Um, so, Brian, when did you, you guys don't get along now, right? It's not that we don't get along. You know, there was a story in the, in the Orange County Register. Must have been a slow week. Mm-hmm. But they were talking about the fact that Brian and I hadn't spoken for seven years after we walked away from the show. And that's true. We didn't. Um, and it, it wasn't that we had a big falling out. We didn't. Uh, it was... A beautiful analogy of David Lee Roth. He was on the show many, many years ago. And David talked about on the air about what it's like to spend a lot of time with the same people. And he said something that I never forgot. And it's a perfect analogy of what it was with Brian and I. Um, He said, we would be in another town, in another hotel, waiting for a gig, eating room service. And I would look across at, at Eddie and go, you know what, man? I hate the way you fucking chew. (laughs) And that's it. That's it. Brian and I, had after 27 years, we were just sick of the way each other chewed. Mm. And it's true. Familiarity breeds contempt. But what really took place is that at the beginning, it was kind of like a marriage. It was kismet. It would take he and I 10 seconds to discuss ideas for the show before we hit on one, quickly threw it together, as long as it was David Letterman-esque and stupid. I mean, it was magic the way that we just were together. And then when we fell from the top uh, with Howard Stern, the ratings fell, we fell. There was distrust between us, like, 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 I don't know what I'm talking about. He doesn't know what he's talking about. And so that magic chemistry that we had in communication, both uh, in preparing the show and talking about ideas, and I think on the air. The shows were still very good, but it wasn't that... Ma- I actually remember driving home in the in the sweet spot, in the heyday when we were great, and I remember th- we had just come off the air of this amazingly good show, and it was it seemed effortless. And I remember thinking, it can't be this easy. But at that time, it was. Because we were just firing on every cylinder. And when, as I said, when the ratings fell, that part 
fell. And so it's whenever he and I get together, you know, it's ha- like we were in Beverly Hills uh, uh, waiting for uh, what, what's the El Pasteo Italian incredible food. We're waiting on our table and I hear Katie go, oh, my God, there's Brian. He was crossing the street into us. And this was the first time I had seen him since we had stepped away from the show. How long ago is this? <sighs> Years, days, times. It was uh, must have been tw- 2018. It's mm-hmm. not that it's yeah, been about, about six years since you so, guys had left. So, yeah. And and we, you know, we picked up where we left off. It wasn't so it it's not that it was a big blow up. It's just that we didn't speak for seven years because we were sick of each other and we didn't have anything else to say. Well, it took seven years to decompress from each other. I think so. And it was welcomed yeah. for both of us. I just, you know, look, I would go in every morning and the same with him. And we would look across at each other four straight hours every day. On the weekend, we did appearances, another mm-hmm. four or five. Um, we were done. We yeah. were just done. Yeah. I get it. And we did We did the, uh, the KLOS asked us to come back. It was their 50th anniversary. We were half of that. They invited us to come. The only reason I did it was because I felt we owed it to the call letters to do that. And I didn't want to do a fresh Mark and Brian show. I wanted to remember what we had done. And that's kind of what we did. And it made sense. And I thought it was good. And the listeners enjoyed it. And that was the key for me. Wanted to do something for them. And so it came out real nice. And so we didn't have the big falling out, the big argument. We just worked together. We were finished. And we walked away. Boring. (laughs) I wish you guys got into a fist fight or one of you was gay. It would have been so much better. Hold on. We still have another half hour. (laughs) Lana Ducey tells the story. Oh, Oh my God. We're so compelled. It's harrowing. He shit my bed. (laughs) No. Threw a bottle at me. Adam, look, then I want to address this because when I wrote this book, I was adamant that I was going to be truthful. I was going to be honest. But I didn't want it. look, Look. you know this as well as anybody. There is a thing in the NFL. In fact, it's all professional sports. It's the locker room rule. It's not written down, but it is understood that you're in a locker room with 53 other guys, and you eat, sleep, drink, work in that room. And there, there are massive disagreements, fist fights that go on because you didn't block for me, and I could have whatever, and, and it's, all, it's a thing. The only people that witness it, are the other 52 in the room and you never talk about it. If you do speak of it outside of that room, you're shunned. No one in the NFL will speak to you. So I didn't want to get into the ugly minutia. I know that's what everybody wants to hear, but I, I find it rude and it's not who I am. However, I didn't depict any idea that he and I were skipping down the yellow brick road <laughs> holding hands. There were many, most of the years that we were capable of doing the show, but off the air, we did not speak. And that's just what it was. So I didn't hide from that in the book. I was upfront and honest about that. But you don't have to be dirty about it either. And I wasn't. And I, Adam wanted it. Look, you know, I'm sorry. Danny would have wanted it. (laughs) Danny would have. I don't want to guilt you, dude, but that's not Bonaducci esque in your storytelling. Danny would have told there would have oh. been fire involved. Just sang uh, like a canary. He look, would have thrown down. Look, booze, da- women. Danny Bonaducci once told me a story that is so. That is the greatest story I've <laughs> ever heard. <laughs> he he told me a story that is so vile. I couldn't whisper it. It was, I la- I, we were sitting in a parking deck outside of Universal. That's how well it, 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 it I remember it. Seared. Oh, it was just the best. And that's who Danny was. And you're right. Danny would be disappointed. Did you, <laughs> you remember when Stern hit the air? And we were talking about it. He would show up. He would get syndicated. He'd show up in the city syndicated wise. And then he'd figure out who was number one. And he would go on full Comanche attack mode. Right. right. So you were in his crosshairs. I was over, not at that exact same year, but a couple years later, we were over on K-Rock and uh, Kevin and Bean. And 
I don't think we really got under into Stern's crosshairs. I, K-Rock was a big station. Kevin and Bean were big, but not so big that they were bigger than K-Rock. Yeah. You know, I, I would say as big a station as KLOS was, uh, Mark and Brian were bigger than KLOS for a long period a of time. Yeah. Kevin and Bean were complimentary right. to K-Rock and the whole sort of zeitgeist they had over there. And I don't remember being singled out or Kevin and Bean being singled out by Stern. I think well, they, they kind of dodged that bullet. It, it's what you said. Howard's uh, <laughs> scheme was to go for the number one program, and he did that. He predicted a year. It took him seven months. And then as we, as our ratings kind of fell out of the heyday, Kevin and Bean, that's right there, 93, 94. That, that's where Kevin and Bean really started to become, I, I believe, a better version of us than we were at that time. Well, you know, it was interesting. They became a K-Rock version of a KLOS show, mm -hmm. which in the K-Rock was just always the little younger, little hipper, little cooler yeah. version of your dad's radio show on your dad's rock mm. station. Right. You know, K-Rock right. always had this cachet and everything around it was cool. Like, it was almost like a brand. It was like mm. Porsche. Porsche makes great cars. And they go, you can't make an SUV? Yes, we can. We make a killer SUV. And they go, you can't make a mountain bike or sunglasses? And they go, yes, yes, we can. But it's all sort of cool it's all designed well it's all sort of fits yeah. with the brand Branded, you know yeah. Yeah, k rock was kind of that way mm -hmm. and was there a little bit of like same team <laughs> shrapnel like cbs radio all that stuff that would have been a little bit frowned upon versus mark and ryan competing network competing station i, I don't think you could have controlled stern if he'd <laughs> set his sights point. on That's kevin and bean it just somehow they were the special needs kids you didn't want to pick on. <laughs> it seemed sad. Mark and Brian were a much easier target than uh, Kevin and Bean. But, yeah, that is – and, you know, I've always said the best part about good ratings is not to have conversations. You know, the, the prop, when you're number one – you get to leave at the end of the day. There's no meeting. When, you're, when your ratings are sliding, you got to stop in for an air check and it's a true. meeting. And Jesus. then and everyone has an idea and oh. here's how we're going to fix it. Mm -hmm. And you can't tell anyone it's a bad idea because they'll go, well, then what's going on with the ratings? You know what I mean? How are you telling me my suggestion is not a good suggestion if this is happening? Right. And the reality, I guess, is it, it's sort of cyclical. It's 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 almost like saying, why is that dog getting old? I got a plan. And it's like, well, that dog was a puppy, and then that dog was this, and then that dog started to slow down a little. But it's it's a sort of a cycle in a, in a weird way, and I don't oftentimes it, know if there's a remedy to the cycle. There is no remedy, and it's it's not weird. It's what it is. Yes. If if if, if I were giving advice to anybody who's thinking of getting into the entertainment field. I, I would say this, learn from the past. If you're lucky enough to get your 15 minutes of fame, enjoy it while you're there. Salt away your money because you're going to need it. After the audience gets a, a good look at what it is that you do, whatever that is, then at some point the next pretty face is going to come along. And you don't have to like it, but you should understand it because that's the way it's going to be. That so, is the greatest story I've ever heard. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is drops perfect. <laughs> thank you, thank you. That is awesome. I, yeah, David Cassidy was playing Wembley Stadium, and yeah. at the end, he was playing a lounge yeah. somewhere. Yeah, and, and he couldn't remember the words. And, and so you would say, well, what happened? And it's like, cycle. Life. Yeah. Look, you know? look, look, the, it's, it's exactly what I said. A after we fell in the ratings, uh, it, as you look back on it, we had our heyday. I did enjoy it and I did take care of my money. And it's not that we were worse or bad. We were doing the same thing. People had heard it. Mm -hmm. And they were ready for the next new thing. And that was, in this case, Howard, and then whoever was next. Um, that's, that's just what it is. We were still doing great radio, but people had moved on. Yeah. And that's just what it is. 
All right, let me hit a quick spot, and then we'll move on and do some I'd news. I'd like to talk some more if we could. <laughs> <laughs> as long as I, we got to get one more uh, douche man drop uh, out, of, out of one of your stories, <laughs> and I'll be fine. <laughs> Tell us how you met your wife. <laughs> All right, let me tell you about crowd health, house, career, marriage, putting life on autopilot guarantees disappointment. Same with health. Open enrollment is here. Take charge of your health care, crowd health. Fund your health care without uh, relying on big government or big insurance. No, no exclusive uh, doctor networks, huge premiums, high deductibles, exclusions, or co-pays, no surprises. Pay one low total to fund your account. I should say pay one low monthly total to uh, fund your account. Your monthly subscription helps find uh, health, sorry, helps fund healthcare cost of an entire crowd health community. Only pay the first 500 of any healthcare event. Crowd health helps you find great care at a fair price. Always pays doctors quickly and negotiates to keep costs down. It's Crowd Health, right, Dawson? Take charge of your health care today with Crowd Health. Open enrollments is the only time you can hit eject on the broken system without penalty, so don't wait. And for a limited time, join for just $99 per month. For your first six months, we use promo code Adam at joincrowdhealth.com. That's joincrowdhealth.com. Promo code Adam. Crowd Health is not health insurance. It's a totally different way of paying for health care. Terms and conditions apply. All right, we'll take a quick break. Come back with Mark Thompson in the news right after this. So let's talk about Time Magazine's shortlist for 2022's Person of the Year. And remember, person is a relative term. Sometimes it's a group. Sometimes it's a theory. It's a it's, thought. It, it, yeah, it is what it is. Uh, so here's the contenders for Person of the Year. And it will be one of these. Yes. And also, it's not a popularity contest. Sometimes it's Saddam Hussein. It's just who made the impact on the year. Uh, Elon Musk, Chinese President Xi Jinping, the Supreme Court, Liz Cheney, uh, Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky, Mackenzie Scott, and I thought, Mackenzie Scott, who's that? Who anyone? That? Anyone? Wife, James Be- Bezos' wife. That's right. Jeff Bezos' ex wife. Oh. She's oh. the signatory to the Giving Pledge, and she made history this year, apparently, with a $122 million donation to Big Brothers Big Sisters. Which I hate because I was going to do that right before. That's right. Yeah. She's totally snubbed Shit. you. Stole uh, your thunder. The <laughs> protesters in Iran. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen. What the fuck is Janet Yellen doing yeah, on there? She was the first woman to take <laughs> on the sucked. role of the she Treasury. She up the economy. She's a fucking idiot. Like, I, I saw it on the screen. I was like, oh, we got the shrew that fucked the economy or helped fuck up the economy. Again, like, it's not a likability contest. <laughs> no, I, I get it, but let's put herpes up there, too. Sure, it, like, it, it, I, the I, silent look, killer. I get China and I, you know, whoever you disagree with or don't disagree. I mean, you could put Kanye West on there because all right, we're all talking about him. Fine. Janet Yellen's horrible at her job and no one's talking about her. Like, why is she out there? And lastly, gun safety advocates. Huh? All right. That's that's too big a group. That's right. I need a face. All right. So now I want to go to a point. I'm going to teach all of you right now how to do a number one rated radio talk show. Uh, Gina just gave a list. Yeah. And who who blew up on it? Corolla. Yeah. The genius of doing your radio show is this. Every day, just do a top 10 list. Let's say the top 10 greatest guitar solos in history and read it. Number 10, number nine, all the way down to number one. And then open the phones. Mm. Mm. Nobody, nobody will agree with the list. Not only who's on it, who's not on it, or the organization of the numbers. It will go for days. <laughs> and all you have to do is sit back and make fun of them as mm-hmm. they give their opinion. Boom, number one. You're welcome. Wow. All right. That is the greatest story <laughs> I've ever heard. <laughs> I've got to have a copy. I'll sit around the house and just play that. I'll do it. I'll Make do it, it your ringtone. <laughs> yeah, for real. He doesn't answer his phone. Uh, let's talk Michael Avenatti. Oh, he... I thought you were finished. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, see, I missed this. <laughs> Mark and I work together every... Talk about needing a break from somebody. Who can say that? I miss you being rude to me. I know, I do. Um, he texted me and he said, I know how much you love me, but please don't touch me. And then <laughs> while you were doing a read, he 
tr- pretended like he stuck his finger up my ass. Oh, so this is the man that I miss. do that with dogs. <laughs> That's right. This is the man <laughs> that has my heart. Okay. Attorney Michael Avenatti. Uh, he was sentenced to 14 years in prison this week for swindling millions of dollars from four former clients, as well as trying to stop the IRS from collecting payroll taxes from his coffee shop? Mm. He had a coffee Uh shop. Diversified. Yeah. Avenatti gained notice for representing uh, Stormy Daniels, who allegedly had sexual encounters with Donald Trump. But as soon as he ran afoul of the law there, he was already serving five years in prison for stealing her profits from the book and attempting to extort $25 million from Nike. Uh, The 14-year sentence Avenatti received on Monday will run back to back with the five years he's already getting. Uh, that's according to a federal judge. Wow. So I'm gonna he's gone use, for now. I'm going to use him as a metaphor for politics in this country, which is he became a rock star, an overnight sensation. Yeah. The, it was a There was panty dropping going mm. on with the ladies of The oh. View and everyone on MSNBC and CNN. They loved him because he said, fuck Trump, I'm going to punch that guy in the face. And right. everyone went, we now love this guy. But here's what I'm saying. Uh, just because you hate Trump doesn't mean you're a good guy. It just means you hate Trump. And if I hate Trump and you hate Trump and this guy says, I hate Trump, it doesn't mean we should follow him or worship him. It just means he hates Trump. And the metaphor is sort of like whatever Trump did in this country, whether it be the border or whether it be tell Germany not to take R- Russian oil right. or not. Uh, I want to be energy independent. Just because you hate Trump, you can't just go fuck the border then, open it up and fuck the pipelines and let uh, let Europe switch to renewable so they can freeze during the winter. Like you, you have this, everyone who had the Trump derangement syndrome had a knee jerk reaction to anyone who hated Trump and then just decided that their policies were great the policy would be whatever the opposite of whatever he would do or whoever hates him the most, we will worship the most. Mm-hmm. And my thing is, is whether it's Avenatti or the border, vet it. Mm. How about you fucking vet what the policy is? And then you might do the opposite. You might worship Avenatti or you might uh, not beef up the border but or energy independence or whatever it is. But don't just do the opposite. You're going to end up with fucking egg on your face because if you go back – two years or three years, and you look at the ladies of The View swooning when Avenatti came out there, he's obviously a shyster who they shouldn't have been swooning over, but they weren't really swooning over him. They were swooning over the fact that he said he hated Trump so much. That in the jawline. That um, in the jawline. I listened to Adam, and that right there is an intelligent, rebuttaled, Rant. Here's my top 10 <laughs> reasons why. So here, here, as he was speaking, and I was trying to hang on to it because it was really up there. Here's what I heard. You're living on a farm and there are 10 pigs living in the mud pen and you've got one favorite pig, but it doesn't really matter because they're all muddy. That's what that's the that's as wow. far as I could go with. Let's hear what the douche man thought of that one. <laughs> that is the greatest story I have ever heard. <laughs> all right. Well it's been vetted. And Adam, let's not forget, you watched all of Pepsi Where's My Jet, right? Oh, I only watched half of oh, it. I haven't watched it. Avenatti's in it. Oh, he's I haven't a, gotten to him yet. He's kind of a big part of it. Wow. Yeah. So he now, he was super in on that. Question. Yes. Gina. Yes. Beside all the fact that he stole a, a porn star's money yeah. and, and all that. Avenatti, attractive or no? Fuck yes. Okay, it's a thought, great jawline. Yeah, it's the yeah. jawline. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I thought the same thing. I thought to myself, "Wow, jawline." Yeah, jawline. look, it's amazing. He's mm-hmm. chiseled. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um. Yeah. There yeah. he is. <laughs> I, I, it looks a little recessive in that picture, but you get it. Yeah, he's dressed nice. You can tell he's showered, and you're right. Check out that jawline. Yeah, uh, the blue eyes and the sort of the, their piercing. They don't hurt. And also, the smooth head. Mm. We're so eh, <laughs> Brian, please. We're so aesthetically oriented that when people look like they know what they're doing, we go, "That yeah. guy knows what yeah. he's doing." <laughs> Good <at> enough. <laughs> but also, him. nobody's mentioned the squint. Look at that squint. Oh, the brooding. Yeah, it's like he's crossing the street. But wait, I've got to look at you for a minute. And yeah. the other thing we really are attracted to by human beings as humans is a self-assuredness. Like he would show up everywhere and just. Speak mm. as if he 
come down from the mountain with oh, the yeah. tablets in That's his correct. hands. You That's know correct. what I mean? Yeah. And he would go uh, to the opposition. He would go on to Tucker Carlson and mix it up with Tucker Carlson, mm-hmm. you know, and, and they would get into it. But he showed up, mm-hmm. you know, and you're like, this guy's got brass ones, you know. Oh. So, uh, which is probably going to hurt him in prison. Yeah. It might protect him. <laughs> oh, well, the brass ones might help, but right. the jawline. Oh, yeah. He should think about putting on some weight. <laughs> You go full Ron Jeremy. People aren't going to fuck with you once you go in the joint. Michelle Avenatti. Mm-hmm. Poor thing. Uh, uh, note to self, I could do this every fucking day. I'm having the best time. Oh, good. Oh, good. Oh, nice. <laughs> I-, I consider that an invitation. So let's talk about Cher. Did you guys know that Cher is dating someone? Yes. Because oh, I dutifully watch TMZ. TMZ. Other than that, did you know he was? She's dating someone forty years younger than she is. Yes, I, God love her. Go okay, her, yeah. she is aware of the age gap. That's the gentleman, Alexander Edwards. He goes by A. E. She's seventy six, and she's now talking about her thirty six year old music producer uh, boyfriend. And she's opened up about their romance on Friday's episode of the Kelly Clarkson show. She spoke to the host who. I'm assuming is home for COVID. She uh, Kelly's on a screen in her pajamas while Cher is in studio. Um, but this is what she had to say about dating someone so much younger than she is. That's hosting. Yeah. It's well, there you stuff. go. <laughs> well, but, but but you know the whole Cher thing, honestly, and, and I love her singing. I think she's an incredible performer, but as a person too. I really admire her, and I don't quite know all of the different qualities that mix together that make what Cher is. But I got to tell you, she could run for president, and I would consider it. Oh, shit. Yeah. I mean, I I don't know what it is, but I love her. Well, she has a rich history of being with younger dudes, certainly well, shorter dudes. Yeah, I was going to say, she didn't start out with one. No, but she she started off with someone who was quite a bit older than her, with Sonny, but then she went to Bagel Boy at some point. Oh, yeah. You guys remember I Bagel really, Boy? Yeah, that's short I, what are you talking about? I remember she had an odd group. Back like of, a New York Post headline kind of thing. Yeah, right? back when we used to be able to be demeaning oh, to other cute. human beings. He has a Stallone vibe. He worked at like a bagel shop or something. They called him Bagel Boy. I do remember this. Gentile, I do believe. I don't think Cher huh. would yeah, get that low. Rob, oh, how dare you. Rob Calamity? Yeah. Camelitti? Yeah, I mean, he's a perfect sort of paisan guy. Yeah, that's Sonny Corolla. Yeah. So sure that is Sonny Corolla. And he was a pretty boy, and he, uh, at the time, she was uh, 47, and he was 23 or something. You know, it was there was a gap. There was a pretty big age gap. So she's grandfathered in to being the grandmother. Grandmother, is yeah. That's basically what I'm saying. Well, she all, yeah, go ahead. She th- That's one of the points. That's a good example of why I think I dig her, because Cher did what the fuck she wanted to. Yeah. And I dug that. He, She was 40. He was 22 at the time. But this is pretty scandalous, like, mm. in the 80s. You mm-hmm. know, there was this gap did not go that direction. Mm-mm. It no. went the other direction. For the men. Also, right. she said on the on Kelly Clarkson that she goes, older men in general never liked me. Only younger men liked me. Mm-hmm. So that's her take. Mm. Older men are not going to take her shit because she's going to give it. That's also probably true. I, that's my opinion. Yeah, she's lashing out on people on Twitter who are like, we're afraid for you. First of all, I think Cher's fine. I'm not afraid for her. We're afraid for you. We think he just wants your money. And she said, like, I didn't, oh, I didn't fall off the turnip truck yesterday. Yeah. So she doesn't like that people think he's taking advantage of her. He's never going to see a penny of that money. Right. No. And I wonder if he even knew any of her songs. Like, I bet he couldn't name one fucking Sonny and Cher song. And do you know what? I don't think she cares if he does or doesn't know that music. I think she's looking for something else. Yeah. Did I, did I wonder if she sold her Malibu place for 80 million bucks that she was trying to sell several months ago? Remember that yeah, of story? Course. Kurt Russell can't sell his. I can't sell mine. What? Hold on, Brian. I don't have Kurt one. Russell can't sell his home. <laughs> that is that is the greatest story I have ever heard. They're not all long, Brian. You got to keep your ears open. <laughs> Quick hitters. It is it is funny when the celeb has to lower the price of the home 
And the thing that's funny is like we wanted eighty five million mm-hmm. and we put it on the market for seven months and now we're at sixty three million and they're disappointed. But the gap between what they were asking and where they're at now is more than every piece of real estate anyone in my yeah. family has yes. ever amassed yes. over the last hundred years. Yes. But we're supposed to feel bad because they were looking for eighty five, <laughs> yeah. even though they spent Eight point seven yeah. in nineteen ninety two. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. I didn't know we were supposed to feel bad. I will. Okay, I'll jot that down. I wonder what she's at. I, it's she, one of those places on. It's you. It's kind of ubiquitous when you go on a PCH and you're just kind of coming up the hill, kind of heading back toward Malibu, or still sort of in Malibu from Zuma to Malibu. You will see this estate well check this out she wants 85 million like you said but she bought it in 1989 for under three mm. oh, oh. Good for you, Cher. good for God you but she did put damn. in a half bath good for you <laughs> <laughs> now i never got around to this story because it never came up but you know about the seacrest compound that he sold Mm-mm. oh yes. god I, I i was holding on to it for so long i think we just got rid of it but he sold his place for 51 million and I think he originally bought it from Ellen. Yeah. And he sold it at what he says is like a deep discount. Mm. And this ha- this has like, you know, various buildings attached to it and movie theaters and all kinds of things. But it seems like he's moving permanently to New York, I'm guessing, for Ryan and Kelly. Yeah. All but right. yeah, his place is, oh, man, that 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 was incredible. Uh, this looks like a hotel. Yes. Speaking of, of Ellen, did you mm. guys talk about that a lot? With, Once or twice. When what? Uh, well, the the thing with reports from celebrities how they were ignored and never met Ellen, never saw Ellen, and oh, then yeah. Ellen her was staff in basically said she was mean. It, but the thing of it is, <clears throat> she came out and made her big apology. And I don't really watch Ellen. I've seen her, and I certainly had respect for all the great things that she was doing with charity and all those things. Um, but when she came out and made the apology, did you notice that she never did say, I'm sorry? Mm-hmm. She never owned it herself because her apology was about how people were treated by the staff. That's right. Mm-hmm. And the reports were about the way she, she treated people yes. or, or should I say didn't treat. And now it's over. And I just wonder. If she had owned it and, I, and said, you know what, I, I'm i sorry, I, I, had, I was having a bad day or whatever you're going to say, but would it have been enough, do you believe, to save it? Because I honestly think because she blamed it on somebody else and never owned a piece of it herself, that ended it. Um, I have sort of mixed feelings about Ellen, which is... <laughs> Um, I don't like all the so-and-so was mean at work. I, I don't, I worked on construction sites my whole life. Everyone was mean and we didn't get free food. <laughs> this is free food, man. It's the cushiest gig right. you're ever going to get. So your fucking boss walks past you in the hallway and doesn't look up or whatever. Suck it up. It's a fucking job. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's not a date. So I don't like all the bitching and moaning about oh, boss isn't nice and all that kind of stuff. My beef with Ellen comes in that she's like, be good people out there. Be Wait, how another. did you guys end your show? Brian would always say, be good humans. Be good humans. All right. Right. And now we know what kind of guy he is. <laughs> Ellen would be like, be kind to each other and I'm going to dance and I'm going to laugh and I'm going to smile and I'm just saying, just fucking own it. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, I like a person that's sort of, oh, you know, Sharon Osbourne is just Sharon Osbourne and I like her for it. I don't yeah. think, I think Ellen's funnier than Sharon Osbourne, but I don't know what version of Ellen we're seeing. There's a kind of cooked up dancing version and then there's a kind of behind the scenes version. It's my beef with Rosie as well. Yeah. Just sort of show me you, uh, warts and all, and I'm fine with it. Don't, yeah. but don't put on the facade and then the let me know you're this. Job club. That's right. All right, let's bring it home, Gina Grad. You got it. I'm Gina Grad, and that's the news. I know how much you love me, but please don't touch me. Gina, Gina Grad! <laughs> that was the news with Gina Grad. Well, I'm going to be at the Rialto Theater December 15th doing stand-up in Tucson, and then we're all going to head out to the Improv in Tempe. We'll do some 
I'll do live shows, live pod there, and then a stand-up as well. We're going to Philly, Dallas, West Palm Beach, Baltimore, Naples. Just go to adamcrolla.com for all the live shows. Mark, the book is called Don't Bump the Record, Kid, My Adventures with Mark and Brian. And it's on sale as we speak. And the proceeds are all going to the Eastwood Ranch Foundation, a nonprofit. So do the right thing, and it's probably a write-off. All right. And I want to thank Barry Burr for coming in here. I am BarryBurr.com for all the live dates. And until next time, Sam Crow for Barry Burr and Mark Thompson, Gina Grandball, Brian, say it. Mahalo. Mahalo.